Welcome to today's webinar with the title StretchFlex, a stretchable printed circuit board introduction. The speaker of today's webinar is Mr. Jürgen Wolf, head of Advanced Solution Center. And now I wish you lots of fun and new information. Thank you, Andreas, for this uh, very kind introduction. And let's start into the topic, stretchable printed circuit board. And so that you have more information on your screen, we are hiding our webcams. And during the presentation, I sometimes will switch it back on so that I can show you some boards. So what do I want to show you today? Um, I will start with uh, explaining what is the basic concept of uh, stretchable printed circuit boards. We will move on then to the process flow. So I will show you how we actually are manufacturing those stretchable boards. Then we will have a short look into the design basics. So what do you need to do to get these boards stretchable in, in layout? And in the end, I will sum up everything and we'll give you a short outlook onto part two. We will divide or we divided this webinar into two parts since uh, the topic is so huge that I could talk for hours basically. And this is the reason why we divided it into two parts. So uh, first part today, the introduction and the more detailed insights. Um, I will mention this during the presentation several times you will get in part two. So let's start with the basic concept. The basic concept is based on a completely new material when it comes to PCB manufacturing. So you know that uh, from the past we are using FO4 for rigid boards, sometimes um, some blends of different resins, uh, but it's basically all FO4. For rigid boards, then we have a polyemide for flex boards and the combination polyemide and FO4 for rigid flex boards. Um, but all these materials, FO4, polyemide, they are not stretchable. To get a PCB stretchable, we need a completely new substrate. And this substrate material is thermoplastic polyurethane. This thermoplastic polyurethane, you probably might know out of completely different uh, industries. So the automotive industry is using this material uh, quite a lot in kilometers of foils for uh, automotive interiors, for dashboards and so on. <clears throat> um, we are using this material now as a substrate material. Um, we we uh, have copper on it now, so it's a copper clad substrate material so that we can realize tracks on polyurethane and how this is being done, you will see now on the next slides. The tracks themselves, they need to be different than in a standard flex or rigid flex um, layout. They need to be layouted in a meander form so that we can realize the stretchability. The copper itself is not stretchable. So therefore you need to do something in the layout that the whole build up will be stretchable. And this, what you need to do is to design and lay out your tracks in a meander form. There are different ways how to do this. We will come to this later as well. Our general aim was we need to use established manufacturing processes. So we didn't build up a complete new fab, like for example, a roll to roll manufacturing for this technology. Everything is based on our existing fab, on the existing equipment so that we have the good knowledge of the machines and we established and the manufacturing based on what we know. And what is really, really interesting and good about this material is that you have very uh, various further processing options. So you can go to a thermoforming or deep drawing. So you can th create three dimensional shapes out of it. You can have a back injection molding, you can laminate it and this uh, what you see here are examples uh, for this. In the middle, you see a uh, stretchable PCB laminated onto a textile cloth. Um, these are uh, pictures from the Fraunhofer Institute in Berlin, the ICM, uh, with uh, whom we did the basic 
um, concept and who did the basic research based on this. And we took their knowledge and put this knowledge in a cooperation to series production. So thank you, ISDM, for this. On the right hand side, you see an example for uh, thermoforming. So we have a polyurethane together with a PC and uh, in a, a 3D um, thermoforming process, you get this dome shape like um, contour or shape uh, with the LEDs on top so that you have a three dimensional form. On the left side, we see uh, basically a, a stretch PCB with a rigid stiffener and uh, the rigid stiffener in the area where we have the assembled components. So what are your advantages? Why is a stretchable uh, PCB of interest? So yeah, first of all, it's the stretchability. So what it really differs from any uh, other technology in, PC, in the PCB world, you can really stretch the material. And to demonstrate this, I will activate my webcam. So, and I hope that you can see it. So I have a small sample here, the autofocus, maybe not so good working, but what you see is I can really stretch it. There are tracks on it in, in meandered shape and I can stretch this so that um, the tracks, the, the conductivity is still going on, uh, but you have a stretchability which is not reached in polyemide or FR4. Then you have a very wide property profile of the uh, polyurethane. We will come to this in the next slides. Uh, we have different uh, physical, chemical, and electrical advantages in this material. It's a very adaptable material. It's very limp so that you can basically combine it with any shape you want. It fits perfectly to this shape because of the limpness of the material. When you compare it to polyemide, um, this limpness is really, really, it's very soft and therefore you can adapt it to almost any shape you want to have it as you see it on the bottom right picture. And you can really rotate it and crumble it without much influence on the stability and the electrical performance like you see in the picture in the middle. So any rotation or any uh, deflection is not that kind of a big issue compared to a polyemide. A polyemide tends to, to break, to, to, to scratch, to have um, problems in reliability when it comes to different bendings. And here in that case, that's not of an issue because the material is so soft that any cracks which might occur are actually already been stopped due to the softness. So the cracks which you might visit or might see in polyemide and Again, I can uh, reactivate my webcam. I have a, a rigid flex board here. So when you look, for example, in this, in this corner here, this might be uh, an area where polyemide might tend to crack and break when you uh, bend it in the wrong way for, poly, uh, for polyurethane. This is not of an issue. So you can really have this even in, in such a configuration that you have a bow and twist like you want to have it. So this is not that big of an issue for the polyurethane compared to the polyemide. And therefore, uh, it's suitable for all kinds of applications in all kinds of different uh, technology sectors. Uh, at the moment, I would say 80% of the products we are already uh, producing and working on is uh, out of the medical sector. But we have uh, a big interest from the sensor technology, from textiles, from robotics, uh, and so on as well. So we are, we are not based on, on any kind of uh, sectors or, and businesses. So if you have an idea behind where this could be used, so even automotive, so in a, in a German um, uh, webinar in the morning, we had the question how to deal with automotive. We didn't have a project in the automotive sector yet, but why not think about it? Uh, the question is always what requirements do you have? What are the demands? What are the regulations behind so that we can talk about it and see if this technology might fit to your idea, to your application. Let's look at the properties of the P 
pure polyurethane. So when we look at the polyurethane without copper, just as a base material, um, it is a very skin friendly material. As this skin friendliness, um, you might, as I already said, that's the reason why it's being used in the automotive interior, for example, quite a lot. Um, <clears throat> it's a biocompatible material. And we are even doing at the moment research and tests uh, regarding the biocompatibility when it comes to the combination of the polyurethane together with the copper and all the different other materials we use when we manufacture uh, the PCB. So even here we are testing if this is uh, fully biocompatible. And it's very flexible and, and limp and I've already shown you this, this limpness. Maybe in comparison again, I switch on my webcam. I have a, a rigid flex or a rigid stretch basically made with the polyurethane and you see it's so limp that this flexible part uh, just falls down basically. When we look on a rigid flex made out of polyimide and you see this is a, a flex here in polyimide, it's so stiff that when I release it, it goes back into form maybe when I go up with the background. So you see the stiffness is so high that even though it's polyimide and it's flexible, it springs back. And compared to, to polyurethane, polyurethane is so limp, it just bows down. So here you see the comparison and the limpness of the material itself. Then it's hydrolysis resistant and microbe resistant so that it can be used in all different uh, medical applications. We have a good weathering resistance and we have a high wear resistance of the material. When you look on the chemical performance, well, it's free from any plasticizers or softeners. So the flexibility and the bendability itself is not being created by introducing another kind of chemistry to make it soft. So there is no plasticizers in the, in the build up. The flexibility is uh, basically created from the molecular structure of the material itself. So you have more rigid molecule structures and more flexible molecule structures in the build up itself. And the combination of these rigid and flexible structures in the polyurethane, this gives you the flexibility and the stretchability. So no additional chemistry inside, which might outgas or whatever. Then it's stable against oils, grease, ozone, tar, and many solvents, as well as uh, diluted acids. And when we go to the physical properties, we have a softening range, a softening area of about 155 to 185 degrees Celsius. Um, if you look close onto this temperature, you might see, oh, there is something I didn't expect. I earlier told you that you can assemble it. And I showed you a picture with components assembled onto this um, to polyurethane. Uh, but now you see 155 to 185 degree and you think, okay, when I solder my boards, it's 245, 250, 255 in my reflow oven. How, 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 that, how does this go together? And yes, you cannot use your standard, uh, for example, tin, silver, copper uh, as your standard solder paste. You need to have a low temperature solder paste and we have quite high experience now with this low temperature solar paste. And as I already said, there will be a second part of the webinar. In the second part, I will show you the recommendations for solar paste and solar profiles to stay below uh, the softening area so that you can still work with it and have still a soldering of components. Then you have a thermal composition of the material of 250 degrees C. Uh, but yeah, if you're using low temperature solars, uh, then you can definitely not go into this 250 degrees C, um, but it's for you as an information. The plain, the basic uh, polyurethane has a fracture strain of uh, around 500%. But please note, you will never reach this uh, stretchability of 500% when we combine it with copper because the copper itself is not stretchable. So the stretchability basically is limited by the copper structures. But the basic material, the polyurethane itself, really would have a fracture strain of uh, times five. Then it uh, has a high elasticity over a very wide temperature range and it's UV and radiation resistant. 
When we look on the electrical properties, we have a dielectric constant of 4.4. Uh, so it's very close to, to the FR4. And again, in the, in the German webinar, I was asked if we have already any kind when it come, uh, any kind of um, knowledge and experience when it comes to impedance controlled buildups. And unfortunately, no, not yet. So when you want to have a differential pair, this uh, might be easier. But if you have like micro strips, or strip lines, there we do not have yet uh, big knowledge. And you will see later why, because of the layout itself, when we want to have it stretchable, um, the tracks need to be layouted in a meander form. And up so far, we do not have any experience how these meanders behave in an impedance built up. Uh, the dielectric strength is uh, rather high. So you see when we have a dry board, it's around 9 kilovolt per 100 microns or 90, volt, uh, 90 kilovolt per millimeter. Um, but you see as well that there is a moisture intake in the material. So when we uh, store it in 80% relative humidity, uh, the dielectric strength goes, strength goes down a little bit due to the moisture intake into the material. So let's have a look onto the process flow. Um, and to keep it short and simple, I will start with the single-sided stretchable PCB here. We take the polyurethane and we laminate it with one single copper side. Um, this technology and this material is so new that there aren't any manufacturers out there at the moment who already offer a copper clad polyurethane. So we cannot buy it like we buy an FO4, or in polyimide with uh, copper. So we have to buy the blank polyurethane, the pure polyurethane in a foil, and then we laminate the copper onto it. Then we go to the structuring, and this is basically the same structuring for the single-sided. It's a, it's a standard substractive structuring. So we, we etch away the non-needed copper. We can drill if you want to. For the single-sided, we do not have any through-hole contacts, but we could make opens. We can make uh, non-through contacted holes. And then this is something which took us quite a long time, which is not very easy to do, but we um, managed it. Um, this is new because now we can secure copper tracks with the same material as the base material. So we can laminate. Uh, polyurethane on top of it so that you have a single material surrounding the copper tracks. When you look on uh, polyemide, for example, um, it's very hard to have a polyemide substrate and have a polyemide cover lay. In, I would say, 99% of the cases, uh, you use a polyemide with an acrylic or an epoxy glue. Uh, in the cover lay so that you can laminate it on top of the polyemide. Um, to have a, a liquid polyemide structuring, this is seldom being, rarely being done. Here in that case, we have the possibility to laminate the same material on top. And it took us quite a long time to find the right process window in the lamination because when you increase the temperature too high, then the bottom substrate melts, gets weak as well, and then the tracks, we, we call it, they swim away. So they do not stay in the same location as they are because the material melts. So this is quite a, a process window we had to find and a, a combination between pressing cushions, process temperatures, vacuum, pressure, and so on to get the polyurethane laminated on top so that everything stays where it should be, but you still have a, 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 a very good... Um, yeah, a very good bond between the top and the bottom polyurethane. What we even saw is that when you do a microsectioning, the bond is so good that you cannot find any kind of interface here in between the top and the bottom polyurethane. So you have one material and no different interfaces. And then, yeah, in the end, you can add your solder surface and do the final routing to get the final form as you want to have it. Regarding solder surface, we have uh, different options. Yeah, the question is always, can we use nickel gold, ANIC? Yeah, you could, but we do not advise you to do so because the nickel itself is so brittle 
that when it comes to any flexible bending, it already starts to break. So this is the same as in polyemide bending. You wouldn't want to use uh, nickel in this builder, but there are other options like uh, chemical tin or using palladium gold, uh, silver gold. These are more the, the surfaces which are bendable. And therefore we at the moment use, I would say in 99% of the cases, either one of these three surfaces. When we switch to the double-sided built-up, well, what do we do? We not only laminate one side with copper, we laminate both sides with copper so that you have a double-sided uh, substrate. And again, now we can do drills. We can go into the plating process and you can have a, a through-hole wire. Then we go to the structuring of the copper and you have basically a double-sided board as you see here. And again, now this new step that we laminate polyurethane on top and bottom again so that you still have a two material built up, but one material embedding the copper tracks. It's only polyurethane, no other glue, no other adhesive needed here in that case. Even if you want to stick an F of four stiffener to the backside, we do not need an additional adhesive. It's just the polyurethane which we use here and the polyurethane is used as the, the bonding agent to the F of four as well. Um, I didn't show the F of four here in this process, but when we go to the next slide, when I explain you the nomenclature for this build ups, um, you will see that this can be combined with F of four as well. But first, yeah, we have this one S and for the namings, we basically adopted the namings as we use it for the flex and the rigid flex build ups. For example, a rigid flex could be named for us a one F five RI, which means we have one copper track in the flexible area and we have five additional tracks. So one plus five means six tracks in the rigid area. So one F five RI means we have six layers of copper in the rigid area, one on top of the flexible. Here again, the same, we just exchanged the F with the S. S stands for stretchable. So instead of flexible, it's stretchable. And the one S means you have one copper layer, nothing else in the stretchable material. Then we have the two S, which means you have two copper layers in the stretchable material. Then we have the one S zero RI, which means you have a combination between polyurethane, the stretchable material and the rigid material, but there is no additional copper track in the F4 or on the F4 compared to a 1S, 1RI. Here you would have a copper layer in the stretchable material and one additional copper layer in the rigid area so that you have an overall of two layers in the rigid area. What I haven't shown in the manufacturing process as well is that we can combine this with solder resist, but please take note that the solder resist itself, uh, it can be applied on the polyurethane, yes, but it's not stretchable as the polyurethane. It's more like the polyemide, it can be bent, yes, but it's not stretchable. So please only use it partially in the area where you want to have components and where you want to have components. Yeah, for sure the components are not stretchable as well. So there it works. You can have this solder resist to act as solder resist so that the solder doesn't flow away from your pad. But in the areas where you want to have a stretchability, please leave it out of the layout. You do not need it there. Okay, so we move on to the design basics. And before we start this, I have a short poll for you. And I would like to ask you the question, which factors have an influence on the stretchability? So Andreas, please activate the poll. All right, so you can choose, um, but that's, there's not one correct uh, question. You can choose all of the possibilities. All so right. it's multiple uh, choice for you. Yeah, <laughs> correct. We already have 10%, um, so 15, 20%, <laughs> the process ongoing. Still a few seconds. You still have the chance to give your idea to the poll. 
Sixty percent. So five seconds, five more seconds for the poll. Then I will close it and show the result. Okay, there's still coming answers. Okay, so I will stop now and show the result and Jürgen will go into the details. Great, so you think that the copper layer thickness and the copper distribution has the highest influence, that the shape of the meander conductor and the base material are on second and third? Well, yeah, this uh, is quite interesting. Um, to be honest, yeah, Andreas, you can switch back to the presentation, thank you. To be honest with you, well, each of these points you've seen here, each of these factors has an influence on the stretchability. And the only question is, which one has the, the highest influence? But they have all an influence, so all the answers were correct. And as you've already seen, and uh, yeah, I already mentioned this in, in, in the previous slides, um, the copper has a very high influence on the stretchability of the, match, of the build up. And therefore, we did quite some testings and quite some investigations behind this. And therefore, we need to find, uh, need to create new reliability requirements. So we saw a stretchability is not being present for, for standard rigid flex or flex built up. So we need to do something new in testing. And what we did, for example, is we wanted to have a look on the cyclic strength when you take different copper structures, so different heights, different thicknesses and even different copper meander forms. And then we'll have a look on the elongation and see, okay, when we stretch it by 5%, by 8%, 10%, 15%, 20%, what happens? And therefore we created millions almost, yeah, not that much, but really hundreds of different samples with different copper structures. We created our own measurement device to have a cyclic stretching. Um, in combination with an in-situ measurement. So here you see this kind of built up. You see the device which is being, or the board which is being tested, uh, clamped in between those two parts. So we have those clamps and they have internal electrodes so that we can measure this track being attached to it. And yeah, then we go to a cyclic load. So you see this in this movie. So we really stretch it and I have this in a little bit more detailed view. So we really stretch it, measure, release it, measure, then we stretch it again. And it's always being measured, the resistance of the track in the minimum and the maximum elongation points. And then we have a look how many cycles the copper track survives. If you have a very bad layout, it's maybe only 10 or 15 cycles. If you have a very good combination between copper height, meander form, and copper width, this can go hundreds or thousand cycles. So it really depends on the copper. And if we have a defect, yeah, for sure we have a look on it. So what actually broke? And here you see two pictures of a horseshoe type kind of layout before we go went or before we went into the cyclic stretching. Everything is nice, you see the tracks, and you see the same layout after the cyclic stretching. And when you have a closer look here, you see this is where the maximum stress must have been because here we have copper tracks which broke. And when you have a closer look, you probably might see that the left-hand one is the one which led to the failure. The right-hand one still has a very small hairline of connection, but you see this in the in the dynamic uh, stretching. So you see a slight increase over lifetime uh, of the resistance of the copper track. So you have this sliding disease, you see that the cracks are starting to, to, to wander into the copper. And when it comes to the breakage, yeah, the resistance goes up into the mega ohms. Um, I already said we have a part two of the webinar and the details which layout forms, which copper thicknesses are uh, uh, relevant and good and not so good. This will be shown in the second part of the webinar. 
for you today, I only can say that there are different meandering shapes which we had a look on. So if this is a horseshoe shape or if this is more a wavy shape or if this is more a zigzag shape or if you have a double line connected uh, in the maximum stress areas with tracks again so that you have a redundancy or whatever. So we had a look on these built-ups and we did some quite a lot of testing and you will see the results of the testing in the second part of the webinar. Today, as introduction, you see there are different forms and shapes which you can use. Um, the question is which track width and spacings can be used. Um, the minimum track and space, basically, you can orientate yourself on our standard manufacturing. So when you look on what we can do in rigid flex and flex, you can do the same in stretch as well. Uh, depending on the copper thicknesses, you can use the track and space from our design rules there. Um, regarding the maximum copper thickness, I was asked in the German webinar as well, so I will give you the answer now as well. Um, at the moment, we are working with the standard thicknesses, 9 microns, 18 microns, 35 microns. More copper doesn't really make that much of a sense because the thicker the copper, the stiffer, the stiffer it will be. And therefore, this uh, stretchability, this, this performance is not given anymore. And so it doesn't make sense for this kind of technology. So that's why we work for uh, 9, um, 18, 12, whatever you want to have. Here we can have a closer look on for your application. We could even, um, the question was as well, can we make, for example, a, a double uh, layer built up or can we make it with, um, a uh, rigid stretch and have thinner copper in a stretchable area. Yes, this could, could be done. We can have we have a button plating process so that only, for example, a through hole via is being plated to the desired and needed thickness of the copper, but in a stretchable area, you still remain, for example, with nine or 12 microns of copper or 18 microns, whatever you want to have. Of course, you can create your own meander design. Uh, basically, everything you can think of is possible. The structuring is like in any other FR4. We structure what you do in your layout. The question is always how reliable would it be during um, uh, stretching? And therefore, it might happen that we do not have experience yet with your specific meander design. So we would have to have a closer look onto this. But you can create your own meander design if you want to. Regarding through holes, and you will see this in a second part of the webinar as well, it was quite a hassle to create those through holes because the material is so weak that when you take the standard FR4 drill parameters, well, basically it wasn't the drilling what we did there, it was a stamping because the drill tool tried to put pressure on the material, but yeah, what happened is that the material itself just backed away and we did more than a stamping than a drilling. So the, the when we did the cross-sectioning, this wire didn't look like a wire. You know, it really looked weird and strange. So the reliability was not given and it took us quite some time to even get those new drilling parameters to get a wire as you see it here in this very uh, well-known form and shape so that it's a reliable copper connection from top to bottom. <coughs> So what else can you do? And I already said, a lot of times you do not want to have it only as a connector where you go from one uh, connector to the other. You want to maybe assemble components on it as well. And the components themselves, they are not stretchable. So you need to either make it rigid in the area where you have the components or you can try to stiffen it. For example, as you see here with this copper reinforcement in the assembly area, you can even go down in the meander shape and the meander amplitude to make it more stiff where the copper uh, should sit. So there are different ways uh, to do this. Or for example, you can have a mesh structure like this cross hatching here um, around uh, in the area of the components to just make it stiffer and to stabilize it. And as you see here, you can add this solder resist partially applied in the area where you want to have the components and outside of the component area, you do not use the solar resist <clears throat> because it's not stretchable. Um, and as I already said, you can use an FR4 stiffener in the area where you want to have it really rigid, for example, for a connector 
or uh, underneath the components so that the component connections are not stressed that much. So let's move on. And again, we have the next poll. And I would like to ask you, which meandered track do you think will break first? So you've seen the different uh, shapes. And Andreas, please open the poll. And now the question is, what do you think? What shape will break or tear first? Is it the rectangular meanders, the meanders in waveform, or the horseshoe meanders? Okay, so this time there is just one correct answer. <clears throat> um, we already have 70%, so yeah, pretty fast. Near to the lunch, okay. So <laughs> around about 80%, another few seconds, then we will stop the poll and uh, show the result. All right. So this is what you have chosen. So 91% of you voted for the rectangular meander and uh, waveform and horseshoe, four or five percent are basically the same. Okay, so thank you for that. Let's go back to the presentation. Good, because in this webinar, I'm, I'm kind of mean to you. Um, I will give you the answer to this poll and to this question in the second part of the webinar. So we have a, short, uh, a small cliffhanger here um, because in the second part of the webinar, I will give you more detailed uh, insight into the reliability assessment, have a look on those different meander shapes. And you will be surprised. You will be as surprised as we were when you see the different results. So there are some surprises in these um, which we didn't think of and which we didn't uh, think might happen. So yeah. For you, as a short cliff, uh, small cliffhanger, you will see these results for the different layout forms and their reliability in the second part of the webinar. At the moment, it's planned for beginning of May. So I hope that you will join us back then. If you already have an idea or already have an application, we have these results already. So do not hesitate and contact us directly if you want to move on with this technology, if you already have this kind of application or an idea behind. You can contact us directly and we can speak about this for the broad uh, mass. Uh, the, the rest will see this in the next webinar and uh, it will be really interesting, I can tell you. Uh, what I, I wanna show you in the second part of the webinar as well in May is how to implement this in the EDA tool. So what can you do in your EDA tool to, to get this kind of uh, meander shapes, for example? And we will go to the assembly of these uh, StretchFlex PCBs. So I already said you need to have a different solder paste and I will show you the results, what we did when we did uh, these uh, tests. And again, in the, in the German webinar, I was asked if we did these tests on our own or if there are already um, manufacturing services, uh, EMS, who, who have experience with this. We actually did all the tests for the soldering of these PCBs together with a partner in the EMS industry, because we do not have the whole equipment of an assembly line to see how is the stencil printing, to see how is the SPI and AOI, how is the placement and how is the, the reflow process. And as always, we started with the, the, the different uh, low temperature solder paste and just to, to, to give you a funny, inside into the solder step and what you will see uh, in the in the second part of the webinar we started off with a, a blank polyurethane with some copper tracks and put it into the reflow oven with a with a chain carrier and yeah what happened is that the temperature was quite a little bit too high on the highest section and we we basically melt the polyurethane onto the chain onto the transport and this was not very nice so but it was funny but uh, on the sec on the other hand it was uh, really interesting that this can happen so we did quite a lot in the research what do we need do we need to have a carrier or can we take the blank uh, stretch hat pcb and so on and so on which temperature profiles do we need which paste uh, performs good which paste doesn't perform as well so you will see all the results in the second part of the webinar 
and for sure you will see some application examples so that you know what uh, can be done already and to sum up everything you see in the material properties so it's uh, very uh, stretchable and therefore we did some extensive testing and extensive testing was necessary we have a stretchability of 5 to 20 percent the question is how often can you do this and this uh, i already said um, five percent are more stretchable than 20 are more cycling resistant than 20 percent for sure you can have multiple rotations of the material without any influence in the properties it's a skin friendly material it's uh, biocompatible at least at the base material and the combination of polyurethane and copper this is what we at the moment look at if the whole build-up is biocompatible as well it has a, a softening area of around 165 degrees celsius plus minus some degrees celsius <clears throat> so that you can for example laminate it onto a textile cloth and have the stretchability of the textile cloth in the pcb as well and you have therefore multiple options what you can do with it you can assemble it still with a, a low temperature solder paste you can go to the thermal forming deep drawing uh, laminate it to any kind of stuff you want to have it and so that you have all different kind of application possibilities in the medical sector in the sensor sector and so on you can combine it with textiles wearables is a rather interesting field here as well so you see a lot of new options and we are happy to present you this today and if you have any more questions and any more ideas behind feel free to contact us you can even request a sample we have these hand examples already for you which you can order you can take it in your hand you can stretch it by yourself you can measure it by yourself so there are contacts uh, there are stiffening structures on it so you can really see what can be done you can order this from us either you write us an email or in future maybe probably in in one or two weeks there will be a section on the website as well where you can order this sample on the website as well so for now contact me or contact your sales rep uh, which you have already a contact to from with electronic and we will provide you with these samples so from now i would like to say thank you for your attentions that you stayed so long in this webinar and i see there are almost everyone stayed till now thank you if you have an application contact us and you will get additional information if not i would like to welcome you to the second part then in may so that you get more information more detailed information for example about the reliability in may thank you and i would like to hand over to you andreas mm -hmm.